Hello, cage fighters and double O agents coming to you from a Jamaican sex shack in Burbank, California. This is the Film versus Film podcast. I am your host, Quinn Boys. I have seen almost a dozen movies in my lifetime, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, three-time back-to-back-to-back champion, and legally, he may now be my father, Leonard Smith Jr. What's up, Leonard? Uh, I almost wasn't going to accept it, but I'll accept that one. I put a little, uh, <laughs> I put a little extra on it to get it through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've never wanted to be a father, but sometimes you just got to step up. You know, sometimes you got to step up and take would that. Would you prefer I said daddy? <laughs> no. I, I, I hesitated. Not. I wasn't sure which variant to go with. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. No variants. No, no daddies. No fathers. Um, well, somebody's the father. Uh, we're going to find that out. Um, this is, we got a fun episode. If very are, unusual episode. Very unusual episode. If you're uh, uh, an avid listener of the podcast. Um, Congratulations, you're my mother. <laughs> good joke there, but I didn't want to insult our listeners. So. <laughs> um, no, but if you are um, and you're Chris Eddins, um, <laughs> you, uh, you know we've had this guest on before and we did them for a video game podcast, which... I won Mortal Kombat beat GoldenEye, and, and we said during that episode, when the two new movies, one was a reboot, remake, Mortal Kombat, and the other was the sixth movie in the installment of the Daniel Craig, whatever, uh, Bond series, we have um, Connor McCabe uh, here, and uh, we're very delighted. Hey, I'm just going to take this point to introduce myself, because you left a space for me, and I appreciate that. And Chris, I have to say, does have a very motherly energy. So I think that was an appropriate pick, actually. <laughs> he does. We're not two minutes in and we've established that Leonard is my daddy and Chris is my mother. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good pair, actually. You know, oh, maybe yeah, I'm in good hands. Picked, but I think it's going to that dynamic's going to be fun. Yeah, very fun. Uh, well, and Connor's we- your brother. <laughs> <laughs> hey, cool. That's true. It's a very family energy here on the podcast today because Connor, you are making history. I don't know, Leonard. Did we get an email back from the Guinness Book of Records? Did they acknowledge? They acknowledge. They they, oh, acknowledge, they acknowledge the email that I sent them, but oh, we will got... not be acknowledged in the book. What? I know. Okay, I, I well, thought that's... it was this the first time. You're sure first you sent ever. it? I, okay, well, I well, sent it. Okay. Well, listen. If it's not historic to them, it's historic to us. It's historic to this podcast. Connor, congratulations on becoming the first two-time guest on the Film versus Film podcast. It's very yeah, – I'm sure you're at a loss for words with this spectacular honor. But Oh, my goodness. I, I am, and I do want to say thank you both so much for making this dream possible. Leading up to this, and I think we've had this planned for maybe a couple weeks now, I've just been telling everybody I see. You, oh, wow. you, you don't know – who I am yet, but soon I'm about to set a record and I'm going to get on your radar. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Well, thank you for being thank here. You. I mean, thank you. Um, we this asked was, this a was few like, other people, but they all turned us down. But yeah. Connor, oh yeah. You, know, you weren't the first person we asked, but I mean, hey, it doesn't listen. It doesn't bother me. I'm used to being second choice and sometimes that works out great. Yeah. Or yeah. by second, I mean potentially eighth. Who knows? Who's to say? Yeah, no, it was it was far. It was closer to twenty second. But they call me Connor, not first choice, McCabe. So I, it is fine. <laughs> What's crazy to think that is we've had, um, I think over like forty guests on this show. We've had wow. forty, yeah. forty, almost forty people on the show. It's pretty crazy. Uh, but you know what, Connor, you're the first double two time guest, and we're here to talk about. Uh, some fun movies. Uh, we have the Mortal Kombat 2021 reboot, and uh, it'll be going against Quinn's. It's not Goldeneye, but it's a Bond film. 2021, two tw- two movies came out in 2021. No Time to Die. Those are the only two movies. The <laughs> only two movies. Uh, no, yeah, this came from. Uh, I, I think it was mostly a joke, or if it was, it wasn't a totally a joke. And I don't remember. It may have been me. I don't remember which of us said it. Um, but we're like, hey, there's a Mortal Kombat movie coming out. When we filmed, did we record in late 2020? Or it, it was probably early 2021. I think it was early 2021, maybe okay. January, February. And we knew these two movies were coming out that yes. calendar year. Yes. And the Bond movie had been delayed like 17 times. The Bond movie had been delayed <laughs> as many times as people we went to before Connor, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, and so we were like, we think it's coming out in 2021. And the. Uh, the much anticipated by Leonard Mortal Kombat reboot was also on the horizon. 
And we were like, we're talking about a Bond theaters. movie and a Mortal Kombat movie. Why don't we just do it again? Why don't we run her back once these have both come out? I, thinking that there was a very good chance that at least the James Bond movie would never come out. And in COVID, you know, you just don't know. But uh, thankfully, they both Quinn did. was literally like the only person like out here in the streets with the signs like every day just demanding the release of this film. And I commend oh, you, yeah. Quinn. I commend you for your effort. I chained myself to the... Uh, <laughs> To the MGM offices. Uh, to, to the Broccoli Estate. Yeah, that's right. To the Broccoli Estate. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they said, it's coming out. And I said, uh, well, I'll, we'll see about that. And I just... Uh, was it was there. it worth the wait, Quinn? You want to tell us about your movie? <sighs> yeah, okay. Let me, let, me, let me talk about mine. Um, I did see this movie in a theater when it finally came out, as I have Ooh. seen every James Bond movie in theaters since I was 11 and saw Die Another Day with... Uh, the the OG Pierce Brosnan. Um, this was uh, Daniel Craig's fifth Bond movie. Leonard, you were you were one off, but that's okay. Uh, and it was sort of the culmination of it was well known, like way back in 2019 when this was supposed to come out, and for a couple years prior that this was going to be his last Bond movie. So there was a sense of finality because. He'd been okay. gone for such a long time. Yeah, mm-hmm. and when you say that, I did not know that. Start watching oh, this movie, and I was interesting. like, the whole entire time, I was like, man, from the beginning, I was like, this feels like this is his last movie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? At least that's an affirmation of how your strong your instincts are, Leonard. Or, yeah, they were <laughs> very strong. Uh, well, and and. So Daniel Craig is also, I don't know how much we talked about Daniel Craig, probably not very much when we were talking about Goldeneye, but uh, his movies kind of reset. I mean, it, they literally reset the Bond canon. They kind of threw out all the movies that came before when he started with Casino Royale back in 2006. So there was a sense of uh, finality that you wouldn't get usually. First of all, not every James Bond gets to, like the actor gets to walk away from the role. Some of them are not asked back. Some of them decide after the movie that it's going to be their last time. So, you know, most James Bond actors have not known it's their last time when they've made their last film. Daniel Craig, that's not the case. So there was, there's that. And also all the Daniel Craig movies have had uh, sometimes looser than others, but they've all tried to tie in uh, some sort of overarching narrative, which was new for James Bond films, which are basically just one-off adventures up Mm -hmm. until that point. So there was also a sense, not that there were so much hanging threads. There were a couple things, um, if you'd watched Daniel Craig's previous four movies, that you figured that they would bring back or tie in. But um, yeah, I mean, it was just, there was a a sense of, ooh, this is coming to an end, I think, uh, that you would not normally have in James Bond movies, even an actor's last James Bond movie, and even considering that this movie had been delayed for like two full years. Um, Yes. Yeah. probably go more into the plot the plot is a typical james bond movie with some key exceptions but connor uh refresh my memory i i know like what you how many of the daniel craig james bond movies had you seen before this had you seen all of them i feel like leonard that's a sure no but i'm not sure for you for me i'm it's five for five uh okay i'm not a particularly uh, this i probably said this on the first time so again to the broccoli family i apologize not trying to disparage your product your brand (laughs) or Quinn, the love of your life being James Bond. Yes. But I haven't seen many of the movies. I think I had seen Goldeneye before, but I wasn't sure. So watching it was really fresh for me. I think I've seen another Brosnan one. It could have been um, the one, Die Another Day. I believe you mm-hmm. were referencing that. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, I think being, when Casino Royale came out, I want to say I was like 14, 15. So sort of a prime, at least what it felt like for me, movie going time, because it was something that you could do as a as a young adult uh, and your parents could sign off on you um, going and just doing whatever you want. Or maybe it was just there was a feeling of independence going to the theater with your friends. Mm-hmm. Um, either way, I've seen all of these. I've seen a few of them multiple times, like Casino Royale. Um, I remember going to this is and this is actually the only one I have not seen in theaters because I watched this on uh, Apple TV uh, Plus. Mm-hmm. So uh, rented that. But I actually, I also have a specific memory of going to see, I believe it was Quantum of Solace after my last high school football game and falling asleep near the end of the movie and waking up and having absolutely no idea what was going on. Uh, So I had to rewatch that, but just a little exhaustion set in. But I've seen these movies and overall, I really like them. So I'm excited to uh, talk about this one. 
Yeah, yeah. Quantum of Solace is kind of a that's my least favorite of the Craig oh, ones. Okay. So I, you know, I bear no ill will towards you for falling asleep during that one. I think uh, I, it's a, it's amazing. Apparently you it's can the get worst that title one. without falling asleep. Apparently it's the worst one of the, of the yeah. Which five. ones have you seen Leonard? Was this your first Daniel Craig? Bond movie? I was, I was literally just looking through them trying to figure out which one I know I've seen casino Royale. Okay. I had and seen, have you seen Skyfall? one and I'm thinking it's Skyfall. It's either yeah. Skyfall or it's Quantum of Solace. I've not seen Spectre. I for sure know I didn't see that. Um, or what is it called? Is it called Spectre? I think Spectre. you nailed it. Yeah. Yep. I'd love to convince um, you it's Spectre right now, but I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it, I, if I wanted to sell, I, I, I could have sold that. It's to you. Which one has the joke. Which one has the parkour in it? That's Most Casino Royale. <laughs> is that Casino Royale? That's, that's one where they're running up the scaffolding and like the being the the the, the construction. I know site. I've seen that one, and that that's one was fire. That's a great one. Um, that's probably still I my think favorite I've Daniel seen Craig one. Another one, but I honestly cannot remember it. So, okay. Um, one of the things you were saying too about how like it was a little different than most typical Bond movies, how they're usually just standalone stories and whatnot. Uh, this movie. I enjoyed and it felt like a Bond movie and there was a lot going on and it was dope and it was long and it was good. <laughs> it was good. It was very good. But the whole time I was like, damn, I wish I remembered the four or had seen the four movies before this. Cause it just felt like, it just felt like I needed more information to truly enjoy it or truly like understand the feelings or the, like the thoughts. And like, it was like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know your, who your boy is. Like, I know he's <laughs> the fire villain in all the other movies, but I don't know Christopher, who Christopher uh, Waltz is in, in relation. I don't to know him. who Christopher Waltz is either. In, in relation to like his character, like Christoph? Uh, uh, Christoph. Yeah, whatever. I mean, give him a couple I, extra letters there. Yeah. Christoph Waltz. Like, it's like, I don't, we are going to expect Quinn to get every Mortal Kombat character's name, right? So just so you know, Quinn is coming back to you. Pal. <laughs> Um, but not nah, it was <laughs> <laughs> but no it was fire and, and but like not necessarily knowing or seeing all the movies before it just felt like a bit overwhelming at times mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. but i still enjoyed it yeah there's a lot of weight uh so that's where i i said um you know, these are the first sequence of movies, the first James Bond to have like sequential stories, things that carry over more than just like all the Bond movies, like would have Felix Leiter or sometimes they would, uh, there'd be a reference to like that. He had a wife who died. Like there would be slight connective tissue, but it never mattered. You never had to have seen a previous movie really because the movie would kind of give you the information you needed. This is not the case in this movie. And unfortunately Spectre is like the second worst Craig movie, I think, but the most crucial to understanding this one. That's the one where they mm-hmm. introduce Christoph Waltz uh, playing Blofeld, uh, who is a Bond villain that they rebooted from, from way back in the Sean Connery days. And uh, that is the part of the movie where I feel like they are, you feel the machinery, like we got to kind of chug through some of this. And I think they mostly considering that they didn't want to just leave it hanging because they spent all of the previous movie being like Blofeld, he's the guy. And then like, yeah. They're like, well, we can't, you know, we got Rami Malek, but we can't like pretend that Blofeld's just not there because what were these previous four movies building towards? So it's unfortunate that they had to kind of carry the water for previous movies. But I think given that that uh, dictate, they did a pretty good job. Um, it does bog the movie down a little bit at times, but also I'm surprised. And, and I give a lot of credit to the film's director, Kerry Fukunaga. The movie feels very like, stylish and light and at times like really fun and loose in a way that uh daniel craig's james bond was not always allowed to which i really which i really liked connor as someone who had seen all five of his movies was there anything about this one that kind of struck you or or, i don't know is that like is that a fair assessment i guess because leonard's just going to agree because he hasn't seen any of these (laughs) you know i do agree uh almost entirely with what you had to say quinn i wish that i would have seen specter one more time uh, I saw, I did see it in theaters and I remember liking it more than most people did, which is, yeah, I didn't I'm often, love that one. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm a prisoner of the moment though. So I can see something like, okay. And be like, well, that was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> and then someone's like, did you, were you not following this movie? Um, but I thought this movie was fantastic. I was also in, when I watched it, to be fair, there were some por- performance enhancing drugs used. I was a little <laughs> uh, stony baloney on the devil's lettuce and I, <laughs> But in in the sort of the perfect mode where you're 
not hyper focused, but you're really appreciative of everything. And you're seeing like um, the detail was very clear to me. So mm. especially near the beginning of the film, uh, in having known that it was Carrie, who my, my close personal friend who I'll say by first name. Yeah. Carrie, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who directed you guys it, went was, to uh, uh, film school together, right? You were his DP for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, and then he was like, I want to make something that looks good. You're out of here, pal. Um, <laughs> oh, no. Which is how he talks. Uh, but uh, I was aware of him and, and of the great work he's done in a few other movies and and specifically the True Detective series. So once it started, especially the opening chase sequence, I, I are they in Italy? Where are they at the beginning? I thought I, they're somewhere in like Greece, the Mediterranean. Well, I, yeah. for a second, thought they might have been in Greece, but that's not correct. I think you're right. I think Italy is close to the, the correct. <laughs> and that's funny because I'm looking at my notes right now. And then my first notice started out great slow grounded and then this nigga gets hit with a bomb and he's just <laughs> fine <laughs> well it's so I funny like, because i know my issues with golden eye i remember it was like what the fuck is this opening scene this is so <laughs> fucking ridiculous it's so over the top so i just remember watching this and like oh okay nice grounded opening i mean the first you know the first story where we meet the girl and his love interest is like oh shit this is like riveting this is good like and it's not too over the top but then then that happens and <laughs> it gets blown mm. up like and then it, the craziness ensues which is you know part of the bond uh you know uh story and so. did you recognize leonard that that grave that he was visiting that got blown up was the uh, vesper who is the the love interest in casino royale the parkour one from the the, the one that you've seen nope i just Oof. knew she must have been from the first movie because i saw she, she died was. in 2003 so she was like <laughs> 2006 she died in 2006, so she was 23 years old. And I was like, Bob was dating a 23-year-old? Sheesh! <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would have been uh, even more happy. I, I did catch that part. I would have been even more happy if on the grave, instead of, I think, being a picture of her, it was just like a gif of parkour. Like, that was his love that died. Because, <laughs> man, that just truly jumped out of the movie into our culture in 2006. Yeah. Oh, that's um, such a great scene, that parkour chase. Yeah. For the best great. Bond chase action scene, I think, still. Um, and I really there, liked. This I don't know, one man. The see. office. That there's office some good ones scene, in this one. Yeah, there's some good scene, ones in this one. You know, from the office. Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh like you're comparing parkour stuff. scenes, not James Bond scenes. Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> All porky, par, porky, parkour. <laughs> um, I, to sort of just wrap up where I was going was it, or, as soon as the film started, I was I also appreciated what Leonard was talking about the grounded nature, how slow it was, being able to pick on, up on some nuances, um, and establishing relationships again, having only seen Spectre once, but then yeah, the action sequences, I was just like, Oh wow, this is so cool. Like you can, Oh, I forgot you can do movies like this. And it's just being a little, little also prisoner of the moment being a little stony, but it so you was a stony, good start for me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, was, I, was I love that it was because I sometimes as a fan of, you know, raised in the Brosnan era, I sometimes long for the over the top theatricality of Bond movies. Mm -hmm. I think the Mission Impossible movies kind of filled that void in the past yeah. 10 to 15 years. And they're like not ashamed of just being spy movies with gadgets and crazy stunts. And All right, well, I'm going to say this right now. Yeah. Um, I also was stony baloney. Um, <laughs> surprise, I wasn't surprised surprise. by that letter. And um, I really thought he was going to kill all those sheep. I thought he was just going to mow them sheep down. I thought I was going to <laughs> Me too. But, <laughs> but um, 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 wait, what did you say? There was something I wanted to say that, but there was something that, uh, what did you just say, Connor? It was it triggered me that I was going to say something. And, uh, was it being captured by like the, the cinematography or like the some of the shots uh, or – the grounded nature of the film. Ah, I lost it. It's okay though, but well, I got the joke off. That's I was going to say, I like that. It was like the second that I was like, cause the, the Craig movies can sometimes be a little too in their feelings for me when it's like, you also have to be a big action movie. Sometimes it feels a little insincere. Um, I love the opening scene where you see um, Madeline Swan, his, his love interest in this movie's childhood. That's a very cool, like, oh my gosh, just to open a bond movie, not with bond, but with a yeah, little girl who's really being cool. terrorized at her home in the middle of the nowhere was, was cool. Yeah. But that scene where he's visiting Vesper's grave, I'm like, Oh no, is this, I like Casino Royale. I like that character, but I'm like, is this going to be kind of like a, a farewell tour? Like when a baseball player who's been around for <laughs> just retires and every time he goes, he just tips his cap to the opposing fans. And it's like, this is very nice, but it's not like, I would rather see you be good at baseball, you know, whatever. Um, and when he's he's looking at the grave, I'm like, oh, man, uh, this might just be kind of a remember these better moments of previous films. And then it blows up <laughs> and then he gets in like an incredible car chase through the streets of 
wherever Italy. And he's like got the machine gun turrets and the big like Hans Zimmer dun, 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 mm-hmm. dun theme. And I was like, okay, this is what I want. This is what we're doing. And like, yeah. you see the villain with the cybernetic eye. I'm like, yes, be a little silly, be a little like fun, yeah. ha- cut loose. And I think this and movie it, tries to mostly balance his accomplishing both. It does. And when it does, it also is just shot so beautifully. It just looks so good. And mm-hmm. then like the opening credits wild, um, a little different, but then the opening credit transition to them, like walking down the side of the building uh, mm-hmm. before breaking into that, that lab is so fucking cool. Oh man. And that sequence too. I mean, there's a lot of sequences in this movie. I think we could just gush about, but that was uh pretty spectacular as well. And to see that scientist, just like, you know, he's going to get his due on these people was like, I hated it because he was so evil. Yeah, he was, it was so good. And now uh, I feel like we should talk about the other movie before we get too, too in depth with the uh, bond, but I remembered what I was going to say. Uh, I don't know if this is going to be to anyone's surprise, but I have not seen any of the Mission Impossible movies. Maybe Ooh. I've seen the first Mission Impossible at some point. I can't remember. Um, yeah. How many you know, are there? you never like seen the seven? first one with the suspended from the ceiling, trying to in the I all feel like room. I've seen parts, but I've never actually sat and watched it. I was like also too young to like, if I maybe saw it, I don't remember it at all. That's fair. So I've maybe seen three, but I, I love, can't remember which ones. I love the Mission Impossible game on Nintendo 64. There was like the first one. There's that one tie into video games. There's one part of the game I could never get by. And it was like you're at a train station and you're a sniper and you have to like shoot people. <laughs> and like while he's like, it, it's crazy. You're like controlling yourself <laughs> in the train station, but you also have to be the sniper. It's wild. I could never beat it. Anyways, um, yeah, but speaking of video games, we're going to talk about the actual video game movie. And that is the 2021 reboot of Mortal Kombat. Oh, man. Yeah. And um. What were you about to say, Quinn? You about to say something? I was just about to say, I'm sorry, I'll let you talk about it, but uh, talk about, as we were with Bond, talk about movies that start, like, fire. You know, like, I was mm-hmm. very engaged. With this. I also saw this movie in theaters, but Leonard, yeah. You oh. can yeah, uh, directed by Simon McCoy. McCoy? McCoy? That's interesting. Uh, came out in April 2021. Uh, we, I, we, I was very excited when we recorded this last one because the trailers all looked very amazing. Um, like... Uh, I stated earlier with the Golden Isle, how it was over top, and the first Mortal Kombat is a little wacky, wonky. This one has started out a lot more grounded, felt a lot more grounded, but also was very intense um, and very over the top in good ways. Uh, but yeah, you start with the opening scene. Well, okay, it's Mortal Kombat. It's the Mortal Kombat reboot. They're finding a new way to tell the story. They're trying to make it more grounded, like I said, more um, relatable. And we start centuries ago in Japan, and uh, always a good way to start some, making something relatable and grounded. <laughs> centuries <laughs> centuries ago, in ago in Japan, straight out of Ghost of Tsushima, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we see um, the uh, I don't I forgot the name of the the clan. Uh, Hinzo, what is it? Oh, no, it will be yeah, no help Hanzo, to you here. Maybe. Hanzo, Hanzo. Yeah, we're seeing um, a member of the Hanzo clan, and uh, he's just with his family. And we witness, you know, like any good old revenge movie, his whole family gets murdered. And he also gets murdered. Well, except for a baby. A baby gets saved and it keeps the lineage. And then we are back to present day and we're seeing one of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, ans- not ancestors, but one of the descendants. Uh, descendants. That's the word. One of the descendants of this clan who is now, he's a down on his luck fighter. And uh, we learned that he has a birthmark, which means he is one of the chosen people to be fighting in the Mortal Kombat. It's the 10th Mortal Kombat. I think it happens every so many years, 100 years mm-hmm. or something like that. And we've lost the last nine in a row. If, um, if the Earth realms lose this, is, this one, then the Netherworld, they can come and they can take over. A lot of shit apparently we don't know about on Earth. but It's like um, America in the World Cup is Earth <laughs> in Mortal Kombat. We just never... <laughs> We're happy just to make it out of the first round. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, uh, but, you know, the Netherworld and them being evil, they don't want to fight. They don't want to play fair. So they don't even want it there to be a chance. So they come to Earth to kill uh, Earth's champions, future fighters in the Mortal Kombat before the uh, before the tournament even happens. And we are following said fighters, uh, fighters trying to learn their powers that they receive if they hone their powers and uh it's a it's 
You know what? I feel like they did a really fucking good job. I think a lot of people were waiting a long time for this and they wanted to do it justice. And it's like, it's got its comedic moments. You know, it's got its touching moments and it's got a lot of, a lot of gruesome moments too. So I think it, it pretty much had everything that you wanted that you were looking for. If you were a Mortal Kombat fan, it's a couple things stuck out to me. Um, one was how, uh, I mean, this is about both movies, how they both open so similarly, uh, peaceful, tranquil, area um someone comes and murders people and the child escapes uh which was kind of interesting i didn't even think about that yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) also a similarity i was that the first two films we talked about goldeneye and the first mortal Kombat, were very uh campy in their own ways maybe some one more than the other but it as we saw i picked mortal Kombat. i think it played to its strength but these um as much as this one does like you were saying have its uh it's comedic moments. It's playful spots because I think it needs it. They're both more obviously a little more serious films and, you know, thankfully 20 something years later, better composed movies. But I, I agree with you as well, Leonard. I was pretty impressed with this movie too. Uh, having such a good time, uh, had such a good time watching it today. Uh, and it struck both of these films. I felt like struck a balance um, in different ways for what they were trying to do. And we could talk about a lot of elements, but that's how I felt. This was your I'll first just time say as someone who, yes. who is not. Oh, yeah, wait. Wait, wait, wait. Did you just ask Connor if he was high? No, I said if this was, I asked him if today was his first time watching it. Oh, I'm I, I was sick. I was sick, so a different sort of high. Um, I didn't even <laughs> need drugs to get there today. <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut in, but I was going to say I was, I think, the, I was the no fun guy uh, last podcast. I was not <laughs> a fan of Mortal Kombat. Um, <laughs> And I stand by that. I don't think it's very good. However, <laughs> I, I didn't have the same background as you guys did playing the video game. Uh, I think there was some general confusion on my part as to whether it was an arcade game or a, or a console game. Uh, you know, Both. I was all over the place. But uh, as someone who's not become a huge Mortal Kombat fan in the uh, year plus that we last recorded, I would say what struck me about this one, which was, I think, kind of checked the box of my complaint from the previous one was that the action was actually pretty good. I thought mm-hmm. it was kind of, you know, I, I know I got on the, the SFX last time, but like, uh, <laughs> or, or the F, SFX, the sound effects, yeah, special, the special, special effects, effects sucked yeah. in the 95 one. I know it was 95, <laughs> but also that it was bad. Um, this one, the special effects look incredible. Uh, Sub-Zero, his ice particles, you get to see a man, punch him uh rip <laughs> slice a man his blood spurts sub-zero turns that blood freezes it turns it into a knife and then stabs him again with his own knife blood that's cinema my friends that is something <laughs> that we do not see every day uh i've um, never seen that before but the 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 fight scenes the choreography from that first scene that very first scene uh you know right away okay you know, the, I feel like the John Wick movies, at least in, in the U.S. and Hollywood, has been like, you got to make your fights a little bit more visceral, a little bit more gritty. You want to feel mm-hmm. the hits a little bit more. I think this, I, it's not John Wick fighting, but I think it took that cue, which is that you can't just do a Mortal Kombat movie without fighting. But also like the anticipation, that scene where Cole is, uh, what are they getting, ice cream or Froyo or something like that? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And then Sub-Zero, and he's just like whipping uh, ice, ice, like uh-huh. hail down on the ground. And it, like it's like a cat of nine tails or something. He's just like raising it and then whipping it. And you see it. I'm like, this is cool. This is, they've thought about these. No offense. Rid- James Bond is one too. Ridiculous characters. And they've been like, okay, let's put them in a slightly more grand about what's a cool thing for him to do instead of yeah. just, you know, exactly fighting in a ring. In and the they still gave us all of like the true fans, like uh, the, the fatalities and the different moves and, and, the, and the different things that their um, characters, their, you know, special techniques. Um, I, I'm going to ask, what do you think are the like were the most gruesome slash coolest moments? I know I have a few in mind. Um, you know, I could sure. go. Yeah, go I've ahead. said knife blood. So Connor, yeah, you go. That one's great. Uh, the one that stuck out to me the most, I think, was when uh, and I'm, I'm looking at a character sheet where Kung Lao is fighting one of the the maybe the 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 lady who's flying around. She's like yes. a little Valkyrie. I don't remember her name. Yes. Um, and at the end of their fight, he like throws his 
his uh like helm his like helmet that is that spins like a saw and then he like jumps on her back and rides her through it and you just see her get split in half and you see a lot of what's inside of her <laughs> but i was also like oh shit and then i think kind of like they do in a lot of these fights he says something like flawless victory and i was like oh yes. yeah that's what i want <laughs> yes exactly she did not touch him uh no. i think her name was natara played by mel johnson mm. and that was uh kung lao max wang um who then gets his soul sucked <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh that was such a funny ass line it's which, not as fun it, as it sounds oh um, no. um, not as fun <laughs> as it sounds um for sure that that was a moment i was gonna say and the other one that i was gonna say is when sub-zero freezes jacks arms and just oh, breaks yeah. them off. oh my gosh oh, yeah and it was like so. It was kind of still early in the movie, and it was just like, wait, this is already happening. Like this movie just, and it had to happen if because if you know Jax, you know he has metallic arms. So it's like, oh shit, this is, this is crazy. And he went from you know like having saying, those like, metallic like, arms to having like he would have like those big jacked real arms to having those like rinky dink fucking <laughs> steampunk fucking arms. That's what this movie understood that the previous one, and I never saw the sequel to the 95 version so Ugh, i'll just say the, the original good, but... the previous original one um did not understand which is like this is a fighting movie this is a movie based on a video game that is entirely about fighting <laughs> like there is no it's not a zelda game where there's other stuff it's just yeah. fighting so like give us some fights up top i don't need a 50 minute building to the tournament oh God, yes thing yeah. of the first one you know like let's just put it in there and i i love that part of it uh, and i thought like you know sub-zero was actually uh you know, scary or at least intimidating as a, as a movie villain this time around. Yeah, you know? it was cool. And it was, it was interesting. Cause I feel like most people would have thought that, that uh scorpion would have been chosen as the villain or, you know, and, you know, antagonist, but you know, sub-zero was a great, was a great antagonist. And, well, we know uh, they're not making another Daniel Craig, James Bond movie. Although of course they will make another James Bond movie in some way, shape or form. But did you, are they making a sequel to this? Is that, oh, they're, yeah, they're, yeah, they're making yeah. another. I okay. think it might be three. I can't oh remember. wow! I can't three it's, other. It's like the Avatar thing. I can't remember. Do a bunch of them. Yeah. Oh boy! It's gonna be a ride at Disney World. It's gonna be great. Mortal Kombat right. Land. Yeah, <laughs> that's why they had to do it right, man. They, you can't make two or three of them. And the first one sucked. So the, and they left. They could. You can like, if it's the Fantastic Beasts. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> they left a lot uh, that I, I didn't know that they would even be trying to set up a second movie or you know subsequent films. Until the end, when uh, uh, Sun Shang is that that's the b- big bad's name, right? Or Sun Shang? Sh- sh- it's either Sheng Shang or hold on, no, it's Shang Sung. Shang Sung. Shang Sung. He w- when you when I understood that, oh, he's definitely leaving and coming back. And then at the end, uh, when Cole is leaving, you know, his little little fighters locker room, and the guy's like. Where are you go? Where are you? Or what are you trying to find? And he's like, it's not what, it's who. And then it <laughs> it like pans over to a to a poster for Johnny Cage. Even as someone who is really not tied to this video game franchise, I was like, yeah, I remember him from the first movie. Yeah. So I was like, oh yeah, they. I forget how big this universe has gotten with the with all the games that have because they're still making these and they're really good. Um. So there's a lot more for them to play with. It'll be see if they can continue to have so much fun and speaking of fun this movie had some really funny parts actually yes yes cabal kano great comic i was about to say kano wasn't in the original was he kano was was. in the original he was he also was the comic relief in the first one but he was uh, disgusting so i might be confusing him with johnny (laughs) cage he was more at his expense well johnny cage was the the comic relief the real comic relief of the first Mm -hmm. the first movie but um, yeah, Kano, man, that the the whole scene with in the in the in the with reptile reptile and uh, yeah, that was a a funny good good fight experience. Um, I'm interested to see who they bring back because a lot of people did die in this first one. So yeah, because um, uh, Kung Lao passed away, um, and then a ha- a bunch of the enemies like go I mean Goro gets got by Cole Young. A lot of people do so. I don't he know. Does this weird thing where like there's he kind of like you remember their souls came out or something like maybe they're gonna oh, come back. Oh yes, I think Goro's coming back because I was really surprised that Goro uh, was killed. And but what was interesting was I don't know if this Cole character is an actual new character in the Mortal Kombat games. I have never seen him, or if they just 
wrote this into the movie and maybe they'll add him after the fact or something. I don't know but, the answer to that either. But Cole is, is not. I can like, say this if, if this might, I, I'm on the Wikipedia for the movie. Yeah. And every other actor, you know, so and so as Kano, you know, Josh Lawson as Kano. You can click Josh, Laws- Josh Lawson and that will take you to the actor's page. And you can click the name Kano and that will take you to the character page. The one character that does not, is not highlighted, is not a link, is Cole Young, which makes me feel like perhaps he is not. In yeah, the, I, exactly. I don't think I feel like this is a very easy back. search, but that's I'm going off that and saying he's an original character. Right. Yeah, cool. Um, um, but yeah, I feel like both of these movies were really good, very different than the uh, the two pre- prior movies we did an episode on. Uh, a lot more grounded, a lot less campy. It's 2021, man. You know, well, it, that is interesting. Yeah, Connor, you brought that up, and just to go back to that for a second, I feel like, um, you know, it's uh uh just about just a bit over 25 years since the originals came out versus the versions that we saw today and so it does really speak to how we go about making like action movies like i do think you know in in the 2000s shit got a bit heavier than it it was in the 90s and i think there was a bit of like realism that audiences uh, whether they were demanding it or not were given in our all of our franchises became kind of like gritty and serious i know the born franchise usually gets a lot of credit for that um the dark knight whatever but um it's interesting because i feel like now not that we are living in uh lighter times necessarily (laughs) but i do feel like you can only take so much drudgery for so long before that the scale starts to tip the other way and and i remember when we were watching the previous episodes movies i was like oh i kind of i do wish that james bond would ride a motorcycle off a cliff into a (laughs) into a plane and then pick up the plane from a nose like i'm okay with letting go of some of that like hyper realism and i think both of these movies are not hyper realistic and i i like that part of it um the james bond movie does that thing which i feel like a lot of spy espionage movies do which is that like the the big bad thing is like it was supposed to be a virus and whether or not because we were living in a very real <laughs> Uh, very viral times they were like well let's do that and then then they made it nanobots but they didn't back off virus so it's like uh, nanobots that carry a virus which is now it's too complicated it should have just been one or the other perhaps but um you know it's all it's it's not afraid to be like a little bit silly which i'm kind of craving more of i feel like we Mm -hmm. don't need the uh the super gritty who wants a super gritty realistic mortal Kombat movie you know I, i like that this was more mature in tone than the other one but also that you know you could get your arms frozen off and then you're limbless like there is yeah you can't make pretty... a super gritty mortal Kombat. that's just not yeah. like a grounded you can't make super... a grounded mortal Kombat movie yeah, yeah. also connor I, I love that you use very respectfully uh, i forget which character you're talking about but passed you away. passed away no, passed which away, is a very nice it. thing for someone who gets like i don't think it was this character but like in a movie where someone gets buzz sawed down the middle yeah it's <laughs> like and he passed away <laughs> as like... if it was of natural causes <laughs> yeah <laughs> You, you hear pass away and you think peacefully in their sleep at 80 years old, yes. not like he had his throat ripped out of his uh, neck and they did hopscotch with it. Um, <laughs> but like, I don't know. Uh, let's, I guess you said there's a lot of fatalities in Mortal Kombat. Uh, you know, I think spoiler alert, obviously for both of these movies, but for the Bond movie, there was a, a fairly big spoiler as they go Two fairly big spoilers, things that have never been done in bond movies before um which i think you guys can both guess he fathers a child a little girl oh my gosh yeah that he finds out about about midway through the film who of course she tells him she's not yours that kid was his she told him it wasn't his leonard but use context clues come on uh he which i remember seeing that at the time and being because that's always the joke right Mm -hmm. I, i mean you know maybe you don't but like Anyone with James Bond movie, people be like, hey, he has all these different women in every movie. Don't you think he's probably got kids on different continent? And it's like, yeah, probably, but it's all fantasy and it's whatever. And the movies, obviously, wisely before now, never go there because mm-hmm. w- w- what can you take? So I think knowing the second twist that was to come, they're like, let's just pull out, a- let's give him a kid and let's give him, <laughs> let's give him a little girl because James Bond is the biggest sexist in cinema. And, uh, you know, and it's, interesting to see that part of it they don't fully live up to it which i or not live up to they don't fully dive into the the ramifications of it which i think is probably for the best i don't think james bond as a father 
those things kind of don't can't feel like they can't coexist with the There's no but, scene where they're like okay. bonding over like Lincoln logs or the way bugs are buzzing around or something. Right. He does make her some crepes. Um, but yes. I thought that was a that was well, a kind of thing. And he's running around with a teddy bear at the end. But like it's it works better than those scenes sound. And I was surprised by how kind of well handled that it's was. It's just funny, like, you know, the story of like Madeline, this girl who her father kills people and you know never comes back and then she has a daughter who her father kills people and mm-hmm. she meets him and he never comes back and i so love that, was, that i'm sorry leonard keep going i was just gonna say a couple of notes i had written down which i thought was funny uh because i once again did not have any true context going into watching this and <laughs> um, <laughs> They, they were like, where's 007? And then they, they cut. And, you know, and then my thought was, he's depressed on a boat somewhere, sir. <laughs> when they cut, like, where's 007? And then um, I then my next note is, is this the last of the Daniel Craig Bond movies? <laughs> and then my next one is, well spotted, sir. I really wish I knew what the fuck was going on. And then uh, that one's, and then the last one is, James ain't depressed no more. He got reasons now. <laughs> he's got a family to fucking fight for. Well, so you didn't know for sure that this was the last James Bond, Daniel Craig James Bond going in, Leonard, but you certainly did at the end because the big twist, uh, something they'd never done before in 25 James Bond movies was he dies. And they make, it, it's not ambiguous. He gets nuked, basically. Uh, and, I'm going to say uh, this. They really missed a moment. They should have had uh, a sweet child of mine playing by Guns N' Roses. <laughs> he did that whole sequence. That might be Would've veering really too good. back into the 90s. I don't know. I think we might be going <laughs> embracing the camp of the 90s too much. But uh, that was a significant thing. And I, I, I will not lie and say, I did not cry, Leonard, but I will not lie and say that in the theater, as someone who has seen James Bond movies since I was like a kid, it was an emotional moment. I thought they landed that moment. I thought it was, it was well done. It was very and well done for sure. It was surprising because they're going to just reboot it and there's going to be another James Bond who will not have that same history or whatever. I though. wonder if the James Bond is going to be black or if they just did what white people do and like just bullshit us. We're like, hey, listen, we gave you a black 007. Yeah, okay? that does, there's it been did a black kind of James Bond now. Yeah, there's been a black James Bond. Lashana Lynch, uh, right? That was, I believe, her name going off memory but uh she plays yes lashana lynch plays nomi aka uh the the female the black female 007 who takes uh daniel craig's james bond's place once he goes into retirement and he's living in his fuck shack in jamaica (laughs) um and she's great i like that scene where she like bumps into him at the club and then like she kind of like i feel that the character is kind of almost like a like a like you say leonard like see we did it um but she herself is good in the role uh, and she's, you know, she's very capable. I remember when they announced it came out that like, Oh, she's playing the new 007, which is very specific language. She's not playing James Bond. She's Mm -hmm. playing the person who inherits the moniker 007 people, of course, on the internet were like freaking out or whatever. But I think um, obviously it was much ado about nothing. This is still a James Bond film, but she does a very good job. I will say this. uh, Quinn was, you know, one of the first people to start a petition to make sure that no black person was going to be 007. Yeah, and, keep James Bond white. <laughs> dot com. <laughs> dot UK. Uh, dot co. Dot UK. Dot co. Type that in real quick. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> she, I, I think on just I noticed about her as well, and I'm sure the, I loved a lot of the performances and the characters in this movie, but she had a very dynamic one where obviously she starts off. Um, how would you want to describe it? A little. Uh, not defensive, but territorial over like mm-hmm. her new position. And like, yeah. is this motherfucker seriously going to walk back in here and just take this from me? Mm-hmm. But she really softens and ends up doing so much in the role that, you know, it doesn't, it does not make up for what people actually maybe want, which is a non white James Bond. But it was, I was at least happy to see that she uh, did a lot with the role. And, and the character wasn't some yeah. flat, whatever character they like tossed to the side at the end. The character reminded me of this character from this uh, graphic novel, uh, Why the Last Man mm. and uh, 355. I don't know. I was just getting real 355 vibes from her. She's like a black, like, um, you know, secret agent in that in that novel. So I so think it, her it was done well. 
I think her highlight in the movie is also like my favorite sequence in the movie, like front to back, which is the oh man, I hope I'm right. The Cuba stuff, right? They're in Cuba when they, it's oh, like yeah. Blofeld's birthday, yeah. and they're celebrating. He's under lock and key, but all the members of Spectre are in the uh, in the room, and they're all yes. celebrating. And then there's just an incredible sequence. I mean, I got to be honest it it it's all it all hinges on Ana de Armas, who is like oh. fantastic in five minutes of screen time, maybe 10 yeah. minutes of screen time. Yeah, she But that it. is the movie that like, it's a shame. I, I, at the moment I was like, it's a shame that this movie has to like close out Daniel Craig's James Bond tenure. And it's got to resolve Blofeld and it's got to do all these things because I would have just loved a movie with no previous entanglements. He's just in Cuba. He meets Ana de Armas who has the ultimate Bond girl flex, uh, Bond woman, I guess we should probably say, but that's the, the dated terminology. But where he, she first meets him, they haven't met each other before and they're about to do a mission together. And she's working for Felix Leiter in the CIA. And she d- grabs him and takes him into a back room and James Bond's like, I know this situation. Okay, let me get my pants off or something. And she looks at him like, with the most like, you're an old man. Like she gives him the most like <laughs> shut down thing. And she goes, no, dude, just change into the suit so we can infiltrate this, you know, thing. And I was like, this is great. Like she kicks ass. She's fun. She looks great. Very uh, playful. Very playful. And there's that great back and forth where Bond uh, gets to kind of like show off his ability with uh, the new 007, LaShawna Lynch. And they're kind mm-hmm. of like back and forth trying to take the same asset. And I really love that sequence. I kind of, part of me is like, get Kerry Fukunaga to do it again. And just, if he wants to, and just be like, do this. Like, I want a movie of this, use that tone and put it on the rest of the movie. Cause it kind of lifts right out of the movie, but it's also the best part. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Who do you want to see as the next bond? Honestly, I'm not, I don't mean to cop out, but I, I, I hope I don't know who the next bond is. I prefer to not, I prefer when they just choose someone who's an unknown. So mm-hmm. I, I have no strong, um, like a lot of people would just be like, I want to see this. Was- had Daniel Craig been in a lot of stuff before he was Bond? He had, but I didn't know who he was. I mean, granted, I wasn't, you know, he'd been, he'd, been, he'd done like Layer Cake and a few other movies, but he what was not on anyone's choose- radar to be James Bond. That's what if for they sure. choose Tom Wamsgams from Secession? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually more of a, that's my other website is make cousin Greg James Bond dot co dot UK. Oh, make Greg, not Tom. And, yeah, no, not Tom. It's actually a six I foot have, seven James Bond. <laughs> yeah, goofy American James Bond. That dude's um, doing Amazon commercials now, man. He's getting bread. It's Uber Eats, too. Uh, oh, is that what it is? It's Uber Eats. I don't know. He's, he's, yeah, that was the Super Bowl commercial. Oh, nice. I just, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I hope I don't know who the next James Bond is, but, um, okay. But we'll Connor, see. you got any thoughts on the next James Bond? No, but I, I was trying to think about um, seeing this movie, uh, who potential uh, other Bonds are. I feel like, I've, you know, you hear names thrown out, whether it's like, oh, Idris Elba or Phoebe Waller-Bridge. So I feel like there's a few names that I've heard thrown out there. I don't know if it's like, I think it's purely people speculating, but um, it, is, is there any other names that you all have heard floated, whether, or does I've that ring a bell Idris at all? Elba. I've heard Idris Elba. I haven't really heard any other names. I don't, you know, I'm not really. I've been hearing Idris Selba for a while. I I almost wonder if at this point he may have aged out because I believe he's like mid to late 40s, which is still looks great. But I know they're probably going to want someone that can do it for 15 years. Mm -hmm. But I'll say this. Daniel Coulier would be kind of dope. Oh, yeah, he would. You um, I think you just figured it out. I think I, I got I got a different. I got a different take for you, but along the same vein. And this was an actor who was not on my radar at all before. Uh, actually, though, is he English? This might be an issue. I do feel like James Bond should be uh, Yeah, English. right. Uh, but I mean, English I, people be playing Americans all the time. So yeah, yeah we can switch not. it up on him. But I feel like Jonathan Majors in the heart of the I knew you were going to say Jonathan Majors. I knew you were going to say Why did you know I was going to say Jonathan Majors? Because when you're like on the same kind of thing, but and then we were like, he's not a British, and I was like, oh, he's talking about Jonathan Majors. Because ah, I mean, yeah. Jonathan Majors is great, and harder they fall. He just had the suaveness that I'm not sure yeah. that I've seen as much from Daniel Kaluuya. I have not seen everything Daniel Kaluuya has done, so I, I'm not saying he couldn't do it. I'm just saying that's not where my mind went. First of all, okay, okay. I cool. just imagine him crying and get out. I can't get that image of him crying <laughs> <laughs> or riding a rhinoceros of Black Panther. Uh, but we can have it be a very uh, like. Uh, out there james bond and have like lakeith stanfield and it's got all these oh like uh, sorry to bother you elements that are just wacky and and crazy 
Quinn would just, be so pissed. Just the Keith Stanfield <laughs> from Atlanta. <laughs> it's just playing his character from Atlanta. Have I'm you guys watched? That. Have you guys watched the new season of Atlanta? I've not. Seen it's just the, the first episodes out, right? No, three episodes are out. Oh, what? No, I haven't watched it yet. They released two the first the first week, and then now nah, it's one episode a week. Okay, y'all should watch it. It's really good. Um, let's get into these talking points. Yes, yes, these. yes. Some of these will be these are these are recent movies. We usually dig a little deeper into our past, the the nineties, the the two thousands. So some of these will, you know, well, I guess really the first Maybe we one. can. Yeah, pop, yeah. Culture. pop culture uh, pop culture is our first criteria as it always is and that's just talking about the pop cultural impact of these movies i honestly feel like the pop cultural impact of no time to die for a long time was just that it kept getting delayed like it was <laughs> sort of the signifier of the pandemic because it was like oh they had to push i mean they had to push so many movies but they had to push this movie like three times and i, I believe i remember reading that like um uh, that like Every time they had to, you know, land on a new date, build towards that date, promote the film, run the commercials, make the trip, it costs X amount of millions of dollars. Oh my gosh, and so yeah. just like the total budget for this thing, when you factor in, uh, you know, advertising was just like an insane amount. And I'm not even sure if it at the end of the day, like recouped it. I, I know it, it did well financially, but obviously it was still somewhat limited by the pandemic uh, when it came out last fall. So, I mean, that's... And, you know, the fact that James Bond dies, I guess that's a pretty big pop cultural footprint. But Yeah, uh, I feel like, you know, Bond, Bond overall is pretty is pretty large. Just the fact that everyone's like, who's the next Bond? You know, I mm-hmm. mean, like that's a, you know, a I should thing. also say the most significant thing to happen at this past week's Oscars, uh, which was that Billie Eilish won an Academy Award for her James Bond song. And everybody was talking about it the next day and everybody had their opinions on Twitter. And you was know, that so. the opening song? Yeah, it was the, it was the theme song. Oh uh, yeah, that shit was pretty dope. I remember watching like this is different. Um, but yeah, man, they just out here using black people for exposure, and then they don't want to give them awards. It's okay. Um, <laughs> Wait, are you, uh, is that against Billy or is that? The, it's the for Academy? Beyonce. It's for Beyonce. Oh, 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 oh the okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, the last like three, like Adele, Sam Smith. And Billie Eilish did the last three Bond songs and they all three won the Academy Award for like best song, which is weird because I think at least one of the the Adele one was deserving. That was a great song. The other two, I'm like, okay. Okay. (laughs) Um, Mortal Kombat, pop culture. I mean, you know, a lot of people were anticipating this movie literally as I was like blood knife on my my elevator, my elevator uh, at my building. I saw a kid outside wearing a Mortal Kombat shirt. I mean, the trailer, the hype after that trailer came out, Blood Knife, Ice Wall, you know, you know, it, it was it was pretty big. I knew a lot of people were excited. To people a lot a lot of people were excited about it. You know, there's another one coming out. I don't know if it has the movie alone has as much pop cultural influencer sway it, as the to- last Bond, but you know, going Mortal Kombat versus Bond. They're pretty close, you know. But it was bombs. one of the first movies that came out, like when everyone was starting to get vaccinated. Like, because yeah. I said I saw it in theaters, and I, I had been vaccinated at that point, and people in the theater were wearing masks, and I saw a very like I don't know Sunday matinee showing, so there were not a lot of people in there. But like, yeah. I do remember being like, "Oh, we're back in theaters," and just because I want to see this blood knife on the big screen, and it <laughs> yeah. was so that part of it. If we talk about the Bond movie being released in the pandemic, I, was, I remember that part of it. I think it For may sure. have been my first movie in like. I don't know, a year, like in a, in a theater. I think that might've been Mortal Kombat. It was either that or Godzilla. It just released a bunch of movies that it's like, I see this on Godzilla. I think I remember you telling me that. I was like, Godzilla. Um, <laughs> Versus Kong. <laughs> it wasn't just Godzilla. There was a giant. Everybody was so hyped about that on Twitter. And I just was took, I had nothing to do. I took no parts in it. I it wasn't very I good. It was just it. fun to see a, a monkey fighting a lizard on the big screen. But. <laughs> Um, okay, next one. How well do these hold up? And maybe we could just compare them from to the first the first movies to this one. I don't even know how this would work because they just came out last year. Well, you know, they both were grounded and 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 not ground, but you know, a lot more grounded, a lot less campy. Uh cinematically looked great. They both were shot very well. I'll say that. Yeah. Better than they- like both of these franchises you would think like deserve. Which is nice, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, it's almost even hard to 
to measure that impact it's so early but at the same time like the each of these films i i love how they do the ones we have done on these episodes have felt connected i think i'm reiterating what i said earlier um but they on their own i thought these were both very strong and very fun for what they did and as much as i did like the first two we saw for their campiness and their 1995-ness uh i think at least at the present moment I enjoy these better, um, but I did watch mm. them each in the last week, so it's hard to say. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, I don't think anybody would disagree with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> these were Unless sure there's some like Golden Eye stands out there. I mean, Golden Eye will always the biggest one. Yeah, right. you, you're, you've met you, here. He is. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I agree. Like, there's just some levels. Obviously, uh, how we feel about films is subjective, but there are certain objective facts, like you know cinematography and story and action scenes and stuff like that, which uh, just in the past 25 years, you cannot compare Mm -hmm. Uh, performances. uh, You know, nobody ever Pierce Brosnan's bond, never had a kid. Pierce Brosnan's bond, never had to die. I'll say maybe some people, some people I'll say that maybe parts that didn't hold up or they didn't like is Liu Kang. Some people were like, they wanted more Liu Kang. Liu Kang was like a very, you know, integral, important part. He's the protagonist in the first movie. And he's kind of more of a side character in, in this one, you don't meet him to kind of late in the movie, uh, like halfway through. So, you know, maybe he'll have a, a bigger part in the second or third one. We'll see. I was going to say Kano uh, as a character just feels like that's the one character that they took from the 90s and did not update. <laughs> <They're> like, this, <laughs> is a, yeah. this is a piece of shit. <laughs> he's like just a pop culture machine, too. He makes yeah. references to he calls, I think he calls someone maybe right in Gandalf he, or Raiden. He calls he he says no Harry Potter shit. I think to like <laughs> Liu Kang, he's just full of like this is going to be be really interesting to see in twenty years. Like how this it Kano's they should just recycle Kano's lines with updated dialogue from pop culture in twenty years. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give you one for No Time to Die. I, I loved just be, the absurdity of that Russian character. Like that guy is in kind of a different movie. That Russian, um, yes, he he's Russian? in Golden he Eye. He is Russian. He's, yes. Well, I'm going to yeah, say like, this. Boris, uh, I, the Russian character, yeah. I am invincible from GoldenEye. This movie also has a crazy Russian nerd who is like evil and vindictive, like behind the scenes. And he uh, he gets to be a little bit racist before he dies, which is a uh, everybody's dream. Like, gave me some pause, like, in a moment, because I don't know that Bond films, uh, they, I, I they just... deal with race and sex and stuff like that in ways that are unspoken yeah that was kind of weird this guy was like we're going to eliminate all the black people with our nanobot virus and i was just like whoa and then he died two seconds later deservedly but yeah it was was like i i don't think anybody was gonna be upset if she kicked him in before he said he didn't need to say that for me to be like ah he didn't just like like you know what i'm saying probably making a statement with that oh they were 100 percent making a statement which was kind of weird for bond but yes, I agree. It was, it, it was a little clunky, although it was nice that she killed him. It was a little mm-hmm. bit like, like you say, Connor, it was like, they were just like, what if we have this character be racist? <laughs> there is one thing like, I do okay. have to say about this scientist though. Mm. My man is terrible at improv. When he was on the <laughs> phone. Yes. I like animals. It was like, what? <laughs> what? This is not believable at all, sir. Get that guy in a one hundred and one. We don't know how. We don't know what kind of scene partner he was working with. You know, you're only as good as the person on the other. Uh, uh, what, one other. Uh, oh shoot, what was it? There is a. Uh, we can probably move on. There is something about. There's something else about that scientist that I wanted to say. I've given too much time to this scientist, but. Uh, uh, he was racist. He was there. He said the thing. Um, okay, I can't remember. Let's keep going. All right, well, <laughs> you know what? You know, we're here to talk about the most important criteria of all mm-hmm. of them, and that is this has was, changed since you've last been here, Connor. So was, I'm hold on years. to your pants. Here it, is. here it is. Was Regina Hall in either one of these movies? No. This is it's 2021. <laughs> Thank you. It's 2021. She could have been Connor, very she could easily, have been very easily in both of these, movies. but she was not. In either one of these movies, they even um, finally put a black woman in. I a Bond was just movie. about to say they put it, it and it wasn't a, a love interest either. So no. missed opportunity for both. Well, there's multiple black women in this movie, so um, that's true. Money Penny, of course. Money Penny, um, mm-hmm. of course, sure, um, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Leonard missed the movie in which Money Penny was introduced, so he's yeah, just saying fair. two words fair. and hoping that it's a name. <laughs> 
Um, you know, Regina Hall could have been Money Penny. She could have been. Um... Regina Hall would be a very funny Money Penny, especially if she played it like her character in Scary Movie. Oh my god! <laughs> okay, I knew you were gonna bring up Scary. Movie. My favorite oh, it remains my favorite Regina Hall performance. Uh, <laughs> wow, Cindy, it, the TV's leaking. Anyway, uh... <laughs> um, she also was not in Mortal Kombat. I don't know where she fits in Mortal Kombat. Um, she could be Sonya Blade. I don't know. <laughs> Sonya Blade, sure. Uh, she could be the wife, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> oh, wow. Real progressive, Leonard. <laughs> hey, man. There aren't that many female Yeah, get her in the movie in just Mortal so she Kombat. can be the woman That's the part that away. didn't hold up in Mortal Kombat. Is there, aren't, there weren't too many female roles. And it, there are, you know, a lot of female roles in, in Bond, and I appreciated that. It was nice. Um, so, yeah, no Regina Hall in either one of these. Mm. Damn That's a damn we're gonna shame. get her one. We're gonna, we're get, gonna her get her eventually. She's, she's gonna be in one of these. <laughs> we, she's in our sights. When but... the sequels to these movies come out, when the next Bond and the sequel to oh. this Mortal Kombat film, and she's in both of them, I'll come back for a third. Oh, Yay. so God help you, Connor, if the new Bond and the next Mortal Kombat fall on the same year. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna do the old film v film lasso. And hey, I in welcome here. it. I can't wait. You're coming back, buddy. Um, okay, number four, fourth criteria, statistics. Statistics. I got something, Leonard, if you, unless you would like to go first. No, you can go I first. for mine. Okay. Yeah, I got mine too. So as I said, the, the box office figure, well, the box office figures are somewhat clear, but the budgetary figures are, it's hard to pin down because they made it for a certain amount when it was supposed to come out in 2019, and then they Good delayed Lord. it a bunch. So what I'm seeing, and I'm going off of Wikipedia, is that this movie was this movie cost somewhere between 250 and 300 million dollars. Wow. Which, uh, Connor's I told you hold on to your pants but they just fell off when I gave you that figure and Oh I mean, no, they're running away. I don't, I don't know why I made you the person whose pants fell off. They could have been mine. But uh <laughs> and it made 774.2 million dollars worldwide. You would think wow. that's recouping their budget, but I also have to imagine Skyfall made a billion. Uh, Spectre, maybe, I think it made a little bit less. Maybe it was like high 800 million Mm -hmm. something. Um, So this didn't make as much. At the same time, it came out when we were still very much in a pandemic and the budget had been, so this feels like a success. It doesn't feel like a smashing success. Uh, James Bond was recently, the property was recently sold uh, to Amazon, uh, Amazon Studios. Uh, How do you feel about that? I'm... Mm, I am worried they're going to Jack Ryan it, uh, which yeah, is where they're, they're gonna just going to make it into a show. They're gonna, yeah. Well, they'll still do the Bond movies, but it'll be yeah. like, you want to see the Q show? And I'm like, no. Yeah. And then they're going to be like, well, it's coming. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I'm a little bit concerned that they're going to take, you know, because I think what makes Bond fun is that uh, not in the Craig era so much. Craig, they were fun for different reasons, but it's that they come out every two or three years and it's basically the same thing in different locales and with different villains and different women you know like and i feel like if we get too much bond all the time it could be like the star wars thing where it's like yeah. back off with this i don't yeah. need three of these a year fuck off <laughs> that's that's so we'll see but uh I, i'm no. not going to judge until something comes out let's see so, how they do with that we don't have to worry about that with Lord of the uh, rings franchise mortal Kombat. What, what what was the um rotten tomatoes yes sorry uh it, well, actually, it was. Let me get the the IMDb as well. Seven point three on IMDb, wow. which is very solid and like yeah, top tier solid. for Bond movies on IMDb. Yeah. And Rotten Tomatoes, eighty three percent fresh. Okay, wow, that's pretty good. I think those are pretty representative numbers. I think those are pretty nice. accurate yeah, pretty as good. to how I felt about well, it. Well, I'll tell you this: you don't have to worry about any Mortal Kombat shows or any uh, overindulgence <laughs> on Mortal Kombat. Uh, the budget for Mortal Kombat was fifty five million. And wow. the box office was eighty three point seven. And you know what? That's a win. I'll take it. It's not a twenty million it's, of that budget was just for the blood knife. It's, it's not. A, it's not a Billy. <laughs> it's not a, a Billy like a, like a, you know uh, the Bond films and whatnot. Um, and now uh, another significant difference, but like the box office is the ratings. Uh, it's a six point one on IMDb. So okay. you know what? That's respectable. If you um, can get it over six for a Mortal Kombat movie, that's a yeah, that's a that's huge respectable. win. And on Rotten Tomatoes, it is a 54%. Rude. So, I know, right? Rude, like, but also, like, again, for a movie with a blood knife, that's pretty up there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it. 
Uh, um, I still think it's better than that. I still think it's better than 54%. I feel, I feel like, honestly, I feel 54% is disrespectful. It's disrespectful. Anyways, it's okay. Uh, so Gotta accept it. That puts us through the first four criteria. We all know what comes next. But I, I do think instead of going right into it, uh, we should, I mean, I guess we can try to do this in our arguments, Leonard, uh, let, stop me if you feel I'm trying to steer the conversation any single way, but I guess we should just acknowledge there's not a very clear prompt this time. <laughs> Effectively, the prompt for this episode is we did an episode before that was like, it. <laughs> uh, that was actually centered around video games. This did not really have that attachment, although Leonard, you can and should talk about the video game, but, um, I think we're just kind of, I don't know. I think we just make our pitches to Connor and see where he lands. Like, I don't know if this is like, what's the best movie? What movie did you enjoy? What movie did you, you know, whatever. So did you have I'd anything I guess those. you wanted to say before we go into our final arguments, Leonard? Um, sorry, I just realized uh, apparently I ran out of space on my laptop in my, <laughs> my <laughs> garage, man. Stop recording like two minutes ago. So we're gonna That's anyways. why we have the Zoom, baby. Exactly. That's Bingo. why we have the Zoom. Um I'll still take your audios. Um but um <laughs> so like the last ten minutes. Um anyways, uh nah, nah, there's uh, you know what? I feel like no matter what argument I make, I'm gonna win. So no, I'm joking. <laughs> um nah, nah, there's nothing uh, uh you know, there's nothing I feel like I need to say before we go into our final arguments. All right, well, why don't you take that confidence and go first, Larry? Okay. Um, we all know Connor, Connor McKay. Like I've always said, nicest man in Hollywood. Nicest <laughs> man in Hollywood. He loves video games. He has a video game podcast. He has a video game Patreon. This all started with a video game episode. Mortal Kombat, it gave you all you want. It gave you everything you wanted as far as a... a a uh, video game fan, a fan of the franchise, and it was a good movie. It was grounded. It was shot beautifully. The fight scenes, the the fight choreography, amazing, out of this world. Um, special effects, cool. Uh, soundtrack was it was fitting. It was great. Um, it had some heart. Had a little bit of depth. It had a comic relief. It had everything you wanted in a Mortal Kombat movie. Um, and, and there's more to come. So, you know, I feel like you can't ask too much of it. And I feel like you got what you wanted. Is it a better film than Bond? I don't know. I I, I don't know if I can say that. I'm sure Quinn is going to argue which one is the better film. And I don't know if I can really argue against that. But if you're going to go walk into a movie, not seeing anything or anything, not knowing anything about either one of these movies, I feel like you're going to have more fun with Mortal Kombat. You're going to be able to follow it. You're going to be enjoying it and you're going to be feel a little bit more fulfilled at the end of the film than you would with no time to die. So, wow. Amazing. Okay. I'm going to start my final argument by agreeing with Leonard. I actually think. Ooh, I, nice move. I shat on. No, I mean, yeah, I know. I'm, this is all, this is all theater, right? But no, but I'm, <laughs> I shat on, I spent this last podcast mostly shitting on, the, the previous Mortal Kombat episode we did about the, the previous movie. And then I went with my fiance and we got tickets to see this movie in theaters because I wanted to see the blood knife and I wanted to see, I wanted to see uh, the spectacle. It looked good to me. And I will say, and, and the pandemic maybe has like melted my brain a little bit or reframed my thinking. Like this is a movie, Mortal Kombat still uh, I'm talking about with simple goals, simple aims that it achieves. And I think, you know, that's what I always, I always talk to my, or my, my friends, Leonard, my brother, whoever, when we're talking about movies, I'm like, if a movie sets the bar here, it's like supposed to be like the hype or whatever is really here. And then the movie's like really good, but it doesn't quite hit that bar. You leave the theater feeling disappointed. Mm -hmm. And if a movie is here and then it comes up to that same level as the previous movie, but the expectations were lower you're like, wow, what a film, you know, like there's just, the, it's all about where your head is at. And I feel like mm -hmm. my head was in the right space for that Mortal Kombat movie. And I did go and I did like it. So I'm going to agree with you on that, Leonard. Uh, Cause I think comparing these movies is the like bar quality. Was set so low. Because <laughs> well, the bar is set low for a Mortal Kombat movie. I mean, let's be realistic. We're not going to see, you know, Schindler's List or something. This is, they're not, these are not important films and neither is James Bond. Um, but I will say like the Bond, No Time to Die had, 
from the delays to the fact that it was Craig's last movie to the fact that he was talking about how he would rather slit his wrists than make another Bond movie after they made Spectre, um, huh. which is a real th- a real thing that he said in the press. Oh my God, he did. With which the is blood like knife. the ultimate, <laughs> the ultimate like prima donna actor thing. Was just, I cannot make another James Bond movie. Oh my God, <laughs> um, but like this movie, my expectations as a James Bond fan were quite high i tried to temper them but it was like this has got to be pretty good especially because i I think and this is too inside baseball for leonard but connor maybe you'll appreciate i think casino royale is great quantum solace is bad skyfall is great specter i did not like i think it's bad so he was two for two and for a bond actor's legacy you don't want to be the guy with more bad movies than good you want to go out with like some oomph you know you want to go out with a good one it was two for four sorry two and two or two for four um (laughs) but like This movie did things that if you had told me they were going to do, they're going to kill James Bond. They're going to give him a daughter. (laughs) Like I would have been like, that's (laughs) terrible. That's a bad idea. It's not going to work. James Bond movies don't do that thing. And so I thought it achieved at moments that lightness, uh, that, that kind of fun that we go to for a Mortal Kombat movie or a James Bond movie, while also against all odds, uh achieving the harder things that i never thought would be would be good and making me actually feel sad when james bond died when i always thought i would just find that stupid um i just thought the bar was set higher than it was for mortal kombat and mortal kombat cleared it i think james bond cleared it as well i think it was doing more difficult thing i think it was more important to that franchise or whatever that they landed that plane and i think they did now it's an overlong movie that's why i say i agree with you leonard i think mortal kombat more easily kind of clears that bar but the bar is lower i think no time to die like pushes that pole just over the like the 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 touchdown line and gets it in but it's so incredible that it did that i think it's the better movie i'm also just gonna throw in connor you pick leonard's movie last time if you want to just throw him some love (laughs) (laughs) that's my argument thank you very much i received the rest of my time you are so welcome uh now is this should i make uh you know have some take as much or as little time as you need Go ahead. Okay. Well, I'm, I feel like I'm going to be reiterating a few things we've talked about on this show. Um, and I just can't get over still the how similar, not similar, but what these movies have in common, both the ones where we watched for this podcast and the first episode that we did. Um, very different expectations. I think for the first two films, it was the campiness, the silliness, the ridiculous stuff was what I latched onto. And I think because of that, uh, you know, what they were setting out to do as much as I think Mortal Kombat original, the first one's probably trying to be a little more serious than, than we found it funny. I still had a blast watching those movies. These today are much closer to, especially the Bond film, like, you know, prestige films. Um, we've lauded these movies for having incredible action sequences for being shot. Well, um, and I agree with with you, Quinn. I think these both have they set they cleared the bar they were trying to reach um, with you know the different goals that they had set. I think it was great that Mortal Kombat you know felt like it was back, and then we're potentially you know setting up these new uh, the the subsequent films with that. The game franchise is still relevant and still uh, like a high quality fighter. As much as it's not a series that I really play, I do hear from people often. And the this was closing out uh, just such an the only bond I've really felt connected to, which even that at the end of the movie wasn't the thing that I was the most uh, gripped by. But I felt a little bit of uh, nostalgia at the end being like, oh, man, I've been watching these movies since I was like 15, 16. Uh, so it's weird to say goodbye. Um, I think both of these movies are really fun. It They enhanced my week so much watching them. Um, but today the movie I'm picking, uh, as my favorite of the two, as much as I liked both is no time to die. Oh, thank you so much. Connor. <laughs> no, thanks necessary. I loved both of these, but I was really captured by that film. Uh, and the, I don't know if it was because I'm on a good movie streak lately. I'm really like locked into performances and and yes. just a few other elements but man i was like satisfying into that but i do agree like if you want to go and watch one of these having not seen you know knowing anything about them mortal kombat is the movie for you but because i had that baggage that history i think that pushed bond over the top for me 
You've been falling asleep in these movies since you were a teenager. I mean, hey, <laughs> yeah. And to, and you know, I didn't fall asleep during this one, so there's a testament. Now you I wish I had tweaked bad. you by trying to shame you into picking it by saying you picked Leonard's <laughs> last time because you spoke so eloquently, Connor. I'm touched. I, I just hey, blood life. I just Quinn, blood knifed Quinn you, Leonard. Needed, Quinn need, oh, he just, oh, I was about to go down 0-3 Quinn, if you didn't pick Quinn me. I was pulling out all the stuff. <laughs> we didn't even speak on um, Madeline's uh, great acting. Played yeah, by Leah fantastic. Leah Seydoux is great. We didn't talk about Rami Malek, who is a great creepy villain. I mean, I think they could have maybe done a little bit more of them or used them a little bit more, mm-hmm. but I think they just took Rami Malek's real life creep factor. And yes. Just like, <laughs> He's like, a that character suit. is a little much, but I still think Rami Malek went there and tried his best. And like, it, I think it's overall successful. It's just, mm-hmm. it leans a little... It's a little much in certain moments for me, but overall, it's like that works. Oh, I remembered that thing I wanted to say earlier, Len, uh, when we were talking. Sorry, I, I know we're gonna kind of wrap towards the end here, but um, what I liked, and, and this is what you're saying, kind of like the James Bond movies have been leaning towards the prestige pretty much. I mean, Casino Royale reignited them, but that made it like just as a as a relevant 2000s mm-hmm. blockbuster. I think it was really when Sam Mendes directed Skyfall, an Oscar winning director, that they were like. Oh, these movies. Oh, are these movies important? And that's yeah. why I think it's there be danger because like they're not really. So you can only take that so far before people are like, this is ridiculous. These are Certainly. these are silly. Um, and I think they tow that line in the Craig series is some, somewhat more successful in other parts um, when they do that. But like little touches like that moment in the beginning of the movie where very creepily effective uh, Safin is wearing the no mask, that kind of... Um, that white mask with the the minimal face and he, yes. when he kills Madeline's mom. Um, and you see that shot of him, like with the house in the distance coming through the trees and going down the hill. And, and it's very ominous. And then later when bond, it's the scene where he's about to realize he has a daughter, he's coming upon that same house and he takes the same path and he cuts through and it's the same shot and the house is in the distance. I think that does a lot of nice things with like, I guess what I'm saying is there's like themes in these Bond movies where the themes in the Sean Connery movies was just like how much sex can one man have in a two hour running time? Which, <laughs> hey, I respect it. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> but but uh, I appreciate the high mindedness of some of the more recent Bond movies, but I'm also a blood knife man. I've been saying it all day. I, I, I do appreciate just a good like stabbing sometimes. So I think these were, I was worried Leonard. And I, the fact that you like this movie, despite only having seen Casino Royale once, uh 15 years ago it sounds like is is touching to me because i'm like yes okay there is something because i was like when is gonna come on here he's gonna be like what the fuck <laughs> like who are what's a cue and who you know like and i, I don't, don't know. know if it's that i'm sick and you all are being extra empathetic towards me and kind but it was such a different dynamic on this episode as much as i love the animosity of the first one of you two going at each other's like childhood nostalgia picks but yeah uh fun it was, i was glad that you two enjoyed both of these as well it's always fun when we both like the movie although le- i never know for sure because leonard's like a a coiled cobra sometimes i we, i get on the podcast i'm like these were fun right and he's like your movie fucking sucked and i'm like oh no <laughs> i'm just taking slings and arrows for nah i was watching it and i was like god damn it this movie is good and i almost like texted quinn i was like nah i'm not gonna let him know I, I lent you my dvd too so i'm like yeah. if leonard beats me and i gave him the tools to watch the movie i'm gonna be real pissed uh oh, leonard texts me he goes do you have no time to die on dvd and i'm like who are you, who are you asking right now like <laughs> do i have you this could movie? not rent it i mean you had to buy it. i don't even you want the blu-ray you want the you want the dvd you want the digital copy i got you man lol um this was a lot of fun even though i lost it's okay um i didn't want to beat quinn that badly anyway um i need this one for the, my mental health <laughs> kind of where can the people find you uh thank you uh and thank you guys for having me again it's always fun to hang out with both of you uh and i was glad i could still make it today so thank you so much um thank you connor Oh, of course. Uh, you can find me on social media, Connor underscore McCabe. I also, as has been said today, I host a video game podcast called Call Me By Your Game, where I sit down with a guest and talk to them about a meaningful game from their past. Speaking of Goldeneye, we actually did that a few months ago. So feel free to check that out. If, if Quinn wanted to do that one, uh, bummer, dude. Um, <laughs> we've had people I guess you repeat. haven't been getting, much like the Guinness people, you haven't been getting my emails, Connor. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, my spam folder is full. Um, oh. But hey, we've redone ones before. But yeah, we do a lot of fun stuff over there. There's a lot more podcasts that we do at Super NPC Radio. But check out, yeah, call me by your game first and then check out other stuff from there. Uh, get to know me a little bit. Um, and thanks again, guys, for having me. There's a Princess Peach Call Me By Your Game 
joke that I'm workshopping. And I wish I had it, but I just want to throw people out there and let you know that I'm thinking about it. Hey, good for you. We'll, we'll hear it on the next episode. All right. Until such time. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Leonard. Gracious loser, Leonard. Uh, in that time, we will see you at the cinema. Have a good one.